Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Jay During. I'm the Associate Vice President of Partnerships with the Office of the Vice President, Research and International at the University of Manitoba. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in a partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. I'm really happy to welcome all of you to our Café Scientific tonight. Our panelists will share their expertise on allergies and feeding of infants and the interesting new research on using active introduction rather than avoidance. Our panel will be discussing this new approach and how it may help prevent food allergies and will offer practical guidelines for families with infants. I encourage you to participate in the conversation with our experts. Your moderator for this evening is May Santos. May studies food allergy management perspectives of elementary school teachers in Winnipeg using qualitative approaches. May received her undergraduate degree from the University of Manitoba in 2018, and currently May is a registered dietitian with the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority and a master's student with Dr. Natalie uh, Riediger and Jennifer Prodiger, who is also on the panel tonight. So Natalie has asked to say a few words before we begin, so I'll pass over to Natalie with uh, miigwech, thank you, and merci. Uh, infant feeding. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, I'm the Endowed Research Chair in Allergy, Asthma, and the Environment, and an Assistant Professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health at the University of Manitoba, and a Research Scientist at the Children's Hospital Research Institute, Manitoba. Dr. During, thank you for the land acknowledgement. Before we start this evening, though, I also want to recognize the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. In these situations, the most vulnerable, including children, are often at the greatest risk. We hope for swift resolution of this conflict and for the safety of those impacted and those providing aid. This evening, we'll be speaking about infant feeding, what, where, and how to introduce food. Please note that our goal is to provide historical perspective and to conform on current guidelines. And this discussion should not be interpreted as medical advice to any single patient. Now I'm going to uh, invite the moderator for this evening, May Santos, who is going to guide our discussion. Hello everybody, good evening, and thank you for that introduction, Dr. Pajer. My name is May, and I'm pleased to be your moderator for this evening tonight, and I look forward to our discussion ahead. So before we begin, here's a quick overview of how we'll proceed in our online Café Scientifique format, and just a few housekeeping rules. Each of our panelists will speak briefly on their perspective based on their expertise on tonight's topic. I will then open up the, th uh, the things up for questions and questions can be posed via Slido. So you will find the link in the description box in the YouTube feed that you are watching on and also on the screen throughout the discussion as shown right now. There is no software needed for Slido. It is just an internet browser and you just need the discussion code to enter. I will be moderating the questions from Slido as well as the interactions with our panelists this evening. With that said, this brings me to tonight's panel experts. I am pleased to introduce Drs. Elana Levine, Edmund Chan, and Jennifer Prodiger. Dr. Elana Levine is a pediatric allergist and clinical immunologist practicing in Toronto and a staff physician at Humber River Hospital. She's also an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Toronto and at Queen's University as an adjunct professor. She is also the current pediatric section advisor for the Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. Dr. Edmund Chan is the head of the Division of Allergy and Immunology in the Department of Pediatrics and clinical professor at the University of British Columbia. He sees patients in the allergy clinic at BC Children's Hospital, and he created the UBC Pediatric Clinical Immunology and Allergy Fellowship Training Program and was its first program director. He is also the current treasurer of the Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, and he serves on the NIAID Coordinating Committee and Expert Panel for the Update to the Food Allergy Guidelines, Prevention of Food Allergy, and is the principal author of the latest Canadian Pediatric Society and Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology Food Allergy Prevention Position Statement. 
Lastly, but certainly not least, Dr. Jennifer Proger is the Endowed Research Chair in Allergy, Asthma, and the Environment, and is an Assistant Professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health at the University of Manitoba. She is also a research scientist at the Children's Hospital Research Institute of Manitoba and an epidemiologist with a clinical trials platform at the J George and Fei Center for Healthcare Innovation. She also holds an adjunct professorship in the Department of Foods and Human Nutritional Sciences, University of Manitoba, and as an affiliated researcher at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. She completed her postdoctoral training there. Her primary research interests include environmental risk factors for and societal consequences of allergic disease using both quantitative and qualitative methods. She is also the section head of Allied Health for the Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology and a member of the steering committee for Canada's National Food Allergy Action Plan. What a great list of people and expertise for tonight. So let's get started, shall we? So that we're all on the same page this evening, I'd like Dr. Prodiger to start us off with a def definition of food allergy, please. May thanks very much for the kind introduction. Uh, again, good evening to everyone. So as described by Boyce and colleagues back in 2010, food allergy is a potentially life-threatening immunological response that occurs reproducibly upon the ingestion of the allergen. Let's break this definition down a little bit because it does contain a number of important phrases. First, food allergy has the potential to be life-threatening. The risk of fatal allergic reaction is very low. Turner and colleagues describe this risk as being on par with death due to lightning, but risk does exist. It is not a condition that carries zero risk. Second, Food allergy involves an immune response by the body. It is not simply a matter of being a picky eater or being fussy. And then third, if someone is allergic to food and they eat that particular food, they will have a reaction each time they eat the food. There may be a few exceptions, such as when a person has some tolerance to say baked egg or baked milk, but they don't tolerate it in less cooked forms. The other important point in this definition is that severity of, the severity of one reaction doesn't predict the severity of another reaction. So if a person has a mild reaction one time, it doesn't guarantee that any future reactions will also be mild. Thank you for that definition, Dr. Podger. And I know that we know many children with food allergy do experience reactions. So can you share a little bit about what food allergy reactions might look like? So food allergic reactions typically occur very quickly after a person is exposed or they eat something to which they're allergic. And these reactions, again, they typically occur within minutes, but they may be slightly delayed. As I mentioned a few moments ago, when I was defining food allergy, the symptoms and the severity of a reaction can differ each time. It's also really important to note that an allergic reaction can start off with really mild symptoms, but then get worse very quickly. So symptoms uh, that are specific to food allergy include a number of different systems within the body. The first system is the skin. Skin symptoms as they relate to food allergy would include things like hives or swelling of the face, the lips or the tongue, as well as itching, warmth or uh, redness. Another system is the gastrointestinal tract or, or stomach symptoms. And these would include things like nausea, pain, cramps, vomiting or diarrhea. An additional system is uh, the airways or the respiratory system. And this may uh, present as difficulty breathing or, or wheeze. As well, the cardiovascular system may be involved. And this is when the person may, uh, they may feel lightheaded, they may be paler than normal, they may have a weak pulse or, or other system, or other symptoms rather. If two or more body systems are involved, this is uh, called anaphylaxis and it's a medical emergency and it would need to be treated with, with epinephrine. The challenge is identifying some of these symptoms in infants as some of the symptoms that I've just described, particularly those milder symptoms may often mimic symptoms of crying or just generally feeling unwell. And then babies up to about two years old, so that, that infant range, those infants may have noticeable changes uh, in their crying, or they may drool uh, a lot more than normal, or they may spit up after feeding. Or B 
these infants may just become more upset, they may be more irritable or more sleepy, they may be difficult to wake up, or they just want to be comforted. Thank you for that. I think it's very important to be aware of food allergic reaction signs and symptoms um, and just have that in mind. Um, with that said, what do we currently know about the prevalence of food allergy in Canada? So the most recent data that we have available suggests that about 7% of children in Canada have food allergy. And this rate has remained relatively stable so between 2010 and 2016. There are some allergies that are more common than others, uh, certainly that we see in Canada. Um, common allergies uh, are peanut, just over 3% of the population, uh, tree nuts and eggs at about 2% each, and then milk at uh, just over 1%. But it's important to, to recognize that these rates may in fact change or differ by age. In younger children and infants, milk and egg allergies tend to, to be more common. Some children may go on to experience tolerance as they get to, towards school age and beyond. Interesting. So, you know, milk, egg, peanuts, and tree nut allergies are often discussed, particularly amongst children. Um, but I'm wondering, can people be allergic to other foods as well? It's a really good question. And, and the short answer is yes. People can be allergic to a variety of different foods. So in Canada, we have estimates of the rates of allergies that I just described, milk, egg, peanuts, and tree nuts. We also know about uh, how the prevalence of, of fish, shellfish, wheat, soy, and, and sesame. So these foods, along with those I just described, milk, egg, peanut, and tree nut, um, along with mustard, are what are called priority allergens in Canada. And these must be declared or, or called out on prepackaged foods that are sold in Canada. But to answer your question more completely, the, the people can be allergic to a whole host of other foods. Some examples, but certainly these are not the only ones to which people, foods to which people can be allergic. They include things like peas or are there legumes, seeds, such as chia seeds, pumpkin seeds, or sunflower seeds, again, along with a whole range of other foods. And the way I think about these is these are emerging food allergens. They're, they're newer food allergies that we may not have seen quite as often before, um, but we do want to be very mindful of the, of the fact that individuals can be allergic to, seek to foods other than the ones we more commonly talk about, such as milk, egg, peanut, and tree nut. But I would say that, that anyone with concerns about an allergy at all to a particular food should visit their primary care provider and then uh, if, if thought to be necessary to request a referral to an allergist. Certainly, I think that's, that's very sound advice and certainly very um, good to be mindful of all the allergies and the potential allergens that are currently existing. So, I, you know, you also mentioned that the rates of food allergy have remained fairly stable in recent years. However, we know that the rates of food allergy are much higher now than about, let's say, several decades ago. And as the focus of this evening's Café Scientifique is on infant feeding and food allergy, I wonder if you could now set the stage for us and share a little bit about what infant feeding practices were historically. Yeah. Happy to take a, a bit of a deep dive into that. So if we think back historically, Infants were, were largely breastfed either by their, their own biological mother or by a wet nurse. And, and as they grew older, uh, they were offered foods that reflected uh, a family's culture as well as the cuisine and the, the family's socioeconomic status. If we look then at what happened around the, the mid to late 1800s, so about 170 years ago, let's say, the first infant series were introduced. These were pretty basic and they were typically mixed with milk or water and, and offered to infants. About a hundred years ago, baby foods, such as the ones we know now, those little jars of uh, strained puree and similar things really didn't exist. Um, but these, project, these products rather emerged on the market as in around the late 1920s and 1930s, so about a hundred years ago or so. 
And advertisements for these products were uh, encouraged the early introduction of solids around three months. And this is evidenced by some of the, uh, the images of infants used on the packaging who were, you know, infants who were four months of, of age. Moving then to the 1950s, infants as young as four to six weeks old were introduced to solid foods, again, four to six weeks. Over the years uh, that followed, uh, there was a shift from really protein-rich, high iron foods to sweeter uh, purees, such as things like uh, pureed fruit um, or, or sweet potatoes, things that uh, an infant may find more palatable. Unfortunately, the shift to, to these sweeter products also took a shift a little bit away from uh, the volume of breast milk in an infant's diet. And then in the 1980s, some studies began to emerge that suggested that the avoidance of solid foods for infants up to six months of age may be protective against allergic disease, including food allergy. And again, this was a these were the data at the time. And I'll, uh, our next panelist is going to speak with about the current guidelines. So again, what I'm about to say is in the, based on historical perspective. But as a result of some of these studies that came out suggesting avoid, many parents grew concerned that early introduction of, of any food before four months would, as Tarini and colleagues later described in 2006, and I'm quoting uh, what was current at the time, inevitably cause uh, their child to develop a food uh, allergic condition. We of course know that this is, is no longer true, uh, as I'm, the as next panelists will speak to. But in that vein, attention also turns to the delay of allergenic foods for similar reasons. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And I think it's it's ultimately really important to understand the historical perspective just so then we can talk about current guidelines. So with that said, I would like to now invite Dr. Chan uh, to the stage so we can talk about the current guidelines and essentially how we got here. So I'd like to start you off with a kind of a harder question. Uh, if you can kindly explain to us, what is the LEAP study? Yeah, so thank you for uh, the introduction and for inviting me to be a panelist. Uh, pleased to be a part of this. Uh, the LEAP study stands for learning early about peanut allergies. And it was a clinical trial uh, based out of the United Kingdom that was uh, recruiting patients between 2006 to 2009. It was uh, funded by a variety of uh, funding agencies uh, from the U.S. and the U.K., largely governmental agencies, uh, uh, for example, the NIH in the U.S. Uh, and the NHS in the U.K., uh, and the National Peanut Board was also uh, a sponsor uh, from the U.S. Uh, so, so that's really the, the, what that study stands for. Awesome. Thank you for that. And so it's it seems like there is a lot of people behind the study. And so would you please explain to us how was the study designed and what were the study's main findings? Yeah, sure. So the study design took um, a randomized uh, trial approach, which is the strongest type of study, and recruited 640 infants at high risk of developing peanut allergy. So these were infants who either had severe eczema, uh, also called atopic dermatitis, uh, or, and or they had egg allergy. And these 640 infants were stratified into one group which received peanut early, starting between four to 11 months in non-choking form. And the other group, the control group, which was not uh, given peanut, and so they were the avoidance group. The group that was given peanut early between four to 11 months was instructed to keep giving it regularly. And this is very important and I'll keep circling back to this concept. Uh, so they had to give two grams of peanut protein three times a week. And they had to do that for a duration of five years. And at the end of the five years of the original trial, both groups underwent uh, food challenges, peanut challenges. And um, the finding, the primary outcome 
was that the group that was introduced early and given peanut regularly three times a week had much less peanut allergy than the group that was avoiding peanut. Uh, there was roughly about an 81 or so percent relative reduction. Uh, so for example, if you combine the skin test negative and the positive groups, you had the group avoiding peanut, uh, about 17% developed peanut allergy versus the group that was eating it regularly, only 3%. So really, again, quite a dramatic reduction of uh, 81%. Uh, the study went on to do uh, what they called the leap on study, where they had both groups um, avoid peanut for one year after the five years, and then they repeated the food challenges. And the worry was that the group that had been eating peanut for five years regularly, uh, if they stopped eating it for one year, the peanut allergy would actually surface. But Thankfully, that didn't happen. And the leap on study showed that even after uh, stopping peanut for a year, there was still protection from developing peanut allergy. And you still had uh, roughly 70 to 80 percent relative reduction for the group that was introduced early. The leap group of investigators have actually continued to follow these participants. So whenever you have a well-studied uh, uh, trial group of participants. It's ideal to continue to follow them long-term. And what they're now doing is doing what they call the LEAP TRIO study, which is where they not only continue to follow the uh, uh, participants of the original LEAP trial, but they also look at their siblings, their younger siblings and look at the younger siblings who are raised in a quote unquote high peanut environment where their older siblings are eat it, eating peanut regularly all the time and compare them to the younger siblings that grew up in a low peanut environment where those participants were told to avoid a peanut. Uh, and it is going to uh, be uh, released relatively soon. This past week at the American Academy of allergy asthma immunology meeting, uh, one of the lead investigators, Dr. George Dutoy, had updated um, the attendees that the LEAP trio results will hopefully be published in the next year or two. So that will uh, result in an extra seven years of follow up for the uh, participants. Um, there are a whole host of other studies that have emanated from the LEAP study, looking at uh, various uh, immune markers, looking at nutritional aspects, looking at novel uh, investigations of uh, food allergy. Um, and, and so it's been really a, a pivotal uh, study. Uh, the world, you know, around that time when people were thinking that, that what Dr. Jennifer, Dr. Protiger was describing with the avoidance, uh, when people were questioning that, uh, there was uh, about, you know, eight years or so where the world was, you know, really eagerly anticipating the results of the LEAP study, which was um, published in 2015. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And thank you so much for that very great um, description of the study. And it really broke it down to its core. And certainly, I think we're all waiting for the, for the LEAP trio to come out. Um, but just going back to the original LEAP study, what happened when these findings were published? Yeah. So, you know, to answer that, I'll just take everyone through a, a little bit of walk through history of my involvement with the uh, food allergy prevention um, uh, implementation in Canada. And so I um, became the uh, pediatric section head of the Canadian Society in 2010, and that's the role that our, our next panelist, Dr. Levine, uh, currently has. And at the time, we didn't have any uh, food allergy prevention guidelines in Canada. So I chose to use that platform of my role to focus on the subject of food allergy prevention in infants. 
And in 2013, after several years of gathering stakeholders together, uh, we published the first ever Canadian position statement for food allergy prevention during infancy. And at that time, the LEAP study had not been published yet. It was about to be published, and we were in that eagerly anticipating phase. Uh, but the most that we could do in our position statement was say that the literature at that moment suggested that we shouldn't uh, unnecessarily delay introduction of allergenic foods beyond six months, but we couldn't give parents a very active recommendation that they should introduce early. And that was because the LEAP study hadn't been published yet. Um, and then so when the LEAP study was published, then immediately our 2013 guideline slash position statement was outdated. Um, and then so it was a bit soon, uh, although we wanted to update it immediately, it was a bit soon because we had just published it in 2013 to update the CPS position statement, which was actually a, a collaboration with the CSACI as well. Uh, and then so I was able to represent Canada, it was an honour, uh, to be part of the NIAID, which is the branch of the National Institutes of Health in the U.S., uh, with their uh, peanut allergy prevention guidelines, which were published in 2017. It involved several meetings with uh, stakeholders across the United States, primarily, uh, where we were in, in Washington, D.C. And that guideline, it was very interesting. It proposed the the concept that for the most high risk infants that there be consideration of uh, screening of those infants which has turned out to be quite a controversial subject uh, as dr Le uh, dr levine and i will elaborate uh, on later probably uh, but uh, then after that uh, there was uh, another guideline uh, a North American consensus guideline that I was involved in that we published, which brought the LEAP findings to the fore. The Canadian uh, Pediatric Society, we published a practice point in 2019, which tackled the tricky issue of should we introduce at four to six months, allow that as early as that for high-risk infants, or should it be a strict six months, which is what the WHO breastfeeding recommendations uh, target. Um, and we felt that for those where the benefit always the risk, that four to six months based on uh, the LEAP study infants being recruited as early as four months uh, was, was something that was reasonable. And so that was the practice point. And then just a few months ago in December 2021, we published, and, and Dr. Levine is one of my co-authors on that, the update to the CPS position statement, which finally had a very active recommendation to introduce allergenic foods, not just peanut, but um, for high-risk infants, uh, encourage introduction of allergenic foods at around six months, but not before four months of age. So that's how that whole early peanut introduction has evolved. I, I wanna add though that you know, it seems like the awareness of this early age of introduction has increased and is quite well known, you know, in many countries around the world. But my biggest concern at present is if we recall back with the LEAP study, uh, study design, a very critical part of the arm that was introduced early was eating it regularly, quote unquote, eat often. And so in the LEAP study, they were eating it three times a week, two grams of peanut protein, but a large amount. Uh, so that's like about two teaspoons of peanut butter three times per week. Mm -hmm. um, and my concern is that that's very, very challenging and difficult to implement in the real world. Uh, we're starting to get some data out of Australia. Australia has really robust epidemiologic data where they uh, look at the prevalence of, of food allergies such as peanut allergy, uh, and they do challenge proven prevalence. So they actually do oral challenges in the clinic to find the prevalence of, of food allergy in that country. And based on that data, they showed uh, in recent publications that they went from, oh, in a 10 year span, uh, let's say from about 2007, 2008 to 2017, 18, 
they went from you know roughly 30% introduced early to about 90% introducing early. However, they showed some data last year that the prevalence of peanut allergy didn't really change. So it was still roughly 3%. Uh, you know, whether it was 2007 or 2017. And so already it had some of us question, is the early introduction truly helping or not? So, you know, you could look at glass half full and say that it's at least prevented the prevalence from going to 4%, from 5% to 6%. But at the same time, if it's still roughly 3%, the early introduction hasn't really decreased. The other thing is just hot off the press is uh, Australia's published uh, anaphylaxis uh, admission rates to hospital uh, for food allergy. And similar story, um, the anaphylaxis admission rates, for example, for one to four year olds continues to increase over three time periods over a couple of decades that they studied. And although again, you could have a glass half full view, which is that the rate of increase of hospital admissions has slowed. You know, at the end of the day, the hospital admissions are still increasing. And so again, my hypothesis for explaining both of these phenomena in Australia is that it's not enough to simply introduce early. And as you know, um, those who are passionate about this around the world, we really have to you know, brainstorm how are we going to get families to eat often, uh, three times per week, you know, in decent amounts, uh, for example, and do that for roughly five years. Um, we don't know because the LEAP study did five consecutive years of that degree of regularity. We don't know if it's okay for infants to eat for one year, for two years, or for three years duration, and then sort of develop interest in other foods and forget peanut. We, we don't know that. And, and so the same logic uh, seems to apply for tree nuts, for sesame, uh, for other allergenic foods. And so I'll, I'll leave it at that as uh, there's certainly a lot of hope with uh, primary prevention, but there is still some concern right now uh, that, that I have about regularity. Sure. And thank you so much for sharing that. And it's, I think it's very useful and very interesting to kind of know the historical back, like the back, the backstage uh, work that has gone into the current recommendations. And it leaves me a really good segue to thank Dr. Chan for his, uh, for his little chat and to introduce Dr. Levine, who is our next panelist. And she is going to be talking about the current recommendations. Um, which is ex almost exclusively, but not just in Canada. Um, and so I guess my first question uh, with you being a pediatric allergist, you know, there's been a huge shift, uh, like we have previously talked about from this, like avoid, avoid, avoid mindset. And now we are introducing early. So as a working clinician allergist, can you tell us a little bit of what it was like trying to share this new message to your families? Hi, May. Thanks so much for having me. Um, you know, I think in any profession, there are conversations that you have so often that you can almost have them in your sleep. So one of the conversations that has just become a daily event for me with families is explaining that this sort of well-entrenched belief that they have that there's any kind of protective benefit to delaying solids is both outdated and actually carries risk. And it's a bit of a paradigm shift, I mean, not even a bit, it's a huge paradigm shift because a lot of the families that we meet as allergists are first time parents. So they're basically following guidance from grandparents or from older members of their family as they try to decide what to feed babies. Um, and it's all very new. So the conversation that happens over and over and over again is the explanation to families in the simplest possible way that not introducing priority allergens to young babies actually carries risk. It's not a benign intervention. It, it's, it's not a not doing something. And that delay itself carries risk. I probably said that three times today in my clinic. Um, so it's been interesting, and yet I have to remind myself on a regular basis that what is very 
logical and, um, you know, well researched to me, like Edmund explained and like Jennifer went into in terms of the background for this, um, it's not that logical for families. It might seem shocking to them to give such a young baby, even less than six months, the things that they have been led to believe carry the highest risk for allergic reactions and anaphylaxis. Um, and it's a lot of responsibility for parents to take that upon themselves. Sure, thank you. And thank you for sharing that. I can imagine that, you know, this being a large part of your work, certainly you have to talk to a lot of families and kind of explain this feel over and over, but in definitely in a way that families can understand and kind of take that into their everyday life. Now, my next question kind of relates to something actually that Dr. Chan pointed out, but if you can kindly uh, talk about what classifies an infant as being at risk for food allergy. Yeah, that's, that's such an important question because there actually is no consensus on that. And the definition of what places an infant at risk has changed over time and with more information, like lots of things do, right? So in the same way as the, the catchphrase of our past two years has been to follow the science, we've also had to follow the science for this. Um, there were some older ideas such as the fact that being the sibling of an older child with a peanut allergy meant by presumption that you are likely or at a higher likelihood to have a peanut allergy or any food allergy or being the child of a parent with a food allergy. And all of those things now we've realized nothing is absolute. So some guidelines were established that, um, and talking about the current Canadian guidelines, a child would be considered at higher risk of food allergy if they themselves or a first degree relative, so a parent or a sibling, has an allergic condition. Now that encompasses a lot of things, right? That just doesn't include food allergy, that includes um, asthma and eczema, so what we call atopic dermatitis, and environmental allergies and food allergies. I think that anyone who practices pe um, pediatric allergy would agree, and I'm sure Dr. Chen would agree with me also, eczema tends to be the biggest red flag. And we know that there is such a deep connection between infants who have a very early onset form of eczema or of atopic dermatitis and go on to develop food allergy, they have a significantly higher chance of developing food allergies that's estimated, I believe, at around 20%. Having a first degree relative with an allergic condition also officially is considered to be a risk factor, but it's not specific to having an older sibling, let's say, with a peanut allergy. And in fact, as someone I think mentioned, one of the things that most concerns us is that by virtue of that assumption, let's say an older brother has a peanut allergy and a younger sister is born, that that will delay the younger sister's introduction to peanut and actually increase her chances of developing that peanut allergy. So again, indirectly, because of that association that we're somehow, um, that families might add to that second child's risk. Right, and thank you for clarifying, you know, the, the, um, the risk. And I think with that said, my next question kind of is more of a practical standpoint. So, and I'm not, and you know, you might have said this today in clinic already, but so what kind of advice do you have then for parents who might be nervous about introducing potential allergens at home, especially, you know, given if they have a familiar, familial risk? So I remind parents that, you know, in Canada, our guidelines have um, come out very, very strongly in support of early introduction and also removing what I'll call delays from that introduction. So in Canada, uh, we are not proponents of screening infants with skin testing or with blood testing. We believe that kids should have almost universal early introduction to the priority allergens um, at a very critical time in their development. So really 
for babies who are at higher risk, at high risk, as early as they can start solids within a short period of time and after taking some other foods to teach parents how to feed their kids, to watch their behaviors as they feed. So babies might smack their lips or move their eyes around or make sounds or push their tongues out. But as they get used to eating, then in short order, we give them those priority allergens early. And the strongest evidence supports doing that for peanut and for egg. But by extrapolation, we think that it's important to get all priority allergens in early and often. So I'm a bit of a broken record at work because I don't want any family perceiving their own baby's personal risk as being so high that it somehow thwarts their efforts to take advantage of what we know, which is that we can minimize that risk by giving the baby a chance at early introduction. And there's almost no deal breaker to that. So the child may have older siblings, you know, with specific food allergies. They may have a parent with specific food allergies. The baby may have significant atopic dermatitis or eczema. Despite all of that, the best chance that the baby has at developing tolerance to these foods, some of which can cause allergens, sorry, allergies that can persist out of childhood, um, is to introduce it early. And I tell my, my patients, parents, that this is like a sliding door. So you don't just stick your arm in it and it opens and then you retreat and say, okay, the door is open. You have to keep going back and sticking a limb in the door if it's actually something that you want to stay open. So it's a bit of a silly analogy, but the door will close. The tolerance has to be kind of exercised before it becomes um, sustained or, or we hope permanent. So there's a lot of hand-holding in the first few months, especially if babies do have an allergic reaction to one food, because it's not a house of cards that will crumble. And many families, if their baby, let's say, reacts to peanut, might then be worried about continuing tree nuts or continuing fish or introducing egg or introducing dairy products. So. I, there's, there's a lot of differentiation in the clinic explaining that just because a baby has had an allergic reaction to one food, we don't want to thwart the process that's going on nicely with the other foods. So uh, hopefully parents take all of that to mind and ha are a little bit um, brave and optimistic and realize that serious anaphylactic reactions in babies when they first start solids are actually quite rare and are lower than they are in children who have delayed introduction of those solids. Awesome. Thank you. And and I think certainly the the repetition of, you know, introduce early and introduce often is something more of a theme that we've been hearing tonight and I think we are going to keep discussing over. Um, and so thank you, Dr. Levine, for your for your very kind um, input. So with that said, uh, I would like now to shift our evening to kind of more uh, like a Q&A discussion. So if I can kindly invite back the rest of the panelists um, for a uh, kind of like an open question and answer. I do notice the Slido, the Slido uh, Q&A poll thing is busting with questions. And so there's there's great interest in this topic, certainly. And so I uh, I will post the first question. And the way I think we'll just do this is I'll post a question to the group. Uh, whoever wants to answer can certainly answer. And um, we can kind of just chat from there. So the first question that I think I will uh, pose, just because I think it kind of flows from Dr. Levine's last point, is that uh, so should allergy testing be done prior to starting peanut and al other al allergenic foods, especially in infants um, at higher risk of food allergy? So, you know, I think we can all uh, you know, have an opinion about this, but um, I've been very uh, involved uh, in that uh, topic, as I was mentioning before, through all, all the guideline work. And the reason this is such a controversial topic is because if you're writing a guideline or a position statement and you're needing to have some uh, type of broad healthcare system approach, 
uh, that involves limited healthcare resources, uh, then uh, the answer should be a straightforward no, because if you were to screen, quote unquote, which means test as many infants as possible before introducing, we know that there's lots of pitfalls. For one, the uh, skin tests uh, and the specific IG blood tests are not accurate when done before an infant has ever tried a food. Uh, there's the phenomenon of a, a quote unquote false positive result, which is very, very confusing. And that can result in indefinite avoidance when a family sees a positive skin test, they're sort of immobilized. And um, uh, ironically, the longer they're immobilized, the higher risk, it's like a ticking time bomb, the higher risk that infant has of truly developing peanut or other food allergy. Um, and so that's one thing. The other thing is that, um, you know, we've been involved in various studies of oral food challenges. There's one uh, that Dr. Protager uh, was doing with us, looking at um, uh, the availability of oral food challenges and um, surveying practitioners as well as parents and doing uh, focus groups and basically in Canada, infant oral food challenges are still not widely available and potentially there could be long waiting lists for them. And so if you have a skin test or a blood test that's potentially not accurate, what's really, really important is doing an infant food challenge in the office. And if there's a very long waiting list for that because only uh, some practitioners offer that, then again, you're introducing unintended delay potentially. So at a healthcare system level, um, it's best not to suggest that uh, infants need testing before they're introduced. On an individual level, however, we can't ignore that hesitancy exists. And that hesitancy may arise because, for example, there's another family member with anaphylactic food allergy, because families have heard from friends or relatives that uh, these foods can be associated with anaphylaxis. And so that's where the art of medicine has to come in. And um, we have to have these sort of heart to heart discussions with families. Uh, these days we like to call uh, this approach shared decision making, but basically describing what are the pros and cons of either uh, uh, testing because it's not gonna be introduced at home uh, or um, not testing and, and you know, risking uh, indefinite avoidance. Um, a sort of in-between approach would be the practitioner that's willing to do observed ingestions of the food for the first time in the office. But again, it's not all practitioners, not even all allergists offer that type of procedure where the very first taste of peanut butter, for example, is in that allergist's office. It's just not something they can offer uh, for a variety of reasons, including, for example, they may have very, very long waiting lists. Uh, and so, you know, really, again, just to summarize that, uh, in general, no, but if there's extreme hesitancy, there may need to be an individualized approach. Awesome, thank you. And I like that little summary that, you know, in, in summary that there, needs to be an individualized approach. So with that said, and I'm just kind of skimming the questions that are still also coming in. Um, I noticed that there's just a few questions that have popped up since our last check. Um, so the next question, it relates to two questions specifically. So the first one is somebody had asked that when providing peanut or any other allergen, how much should be provided at each time? And then a secondary question that I'm going to uh, piggyback into that is, that for infants who have failed the primary prevention and acquire food allergies despite this early introduction, is long-term avoidance the only option for management? Maybe, maybe I don't know, Dr. Levine, do you want to answer the amount one and then I'll tackle the, the other uh, sure. options? Yeah, so... I guess 
you know, the elusive amount, how much is necessary, in what form, how often, um, I think we'd all love to know exactly what the perfect recipe is for how much of an allergen a baby needs to eat. Um, what um, Dr. Chan had said before was that, you know, the one study that really tried to, to parse that out was the LEAP study that actually had in its methods a specific amount of peanut protein, you know, several times per week for the uh, intervention group, okay? What we tend to tell people and the guidelines that we give, for example, are for peanut butter, that it's something like two teaspoons mixed in with a food to make it texture appropriate. So warm water or breast milk or fruit puree or something to make it less sticky and thick. And that that should be given a few times each week. Okay, let's say three, but ideally more than one. So we know for peanut, we have kind of like a guideline. For other foods, we first of all, a baby's developmental level may limit how much they'll take of a food. And we're not recommending at any point, you know, forcing a baby to take more than they'll take naturally according to appetite and developmental stage. So at the beginning, um, you know, they may not take large amounts. But what we want them to take is a portion size of that food in its natural form. So we still do tend to think that the real food is better than, let's say, a powdered form or um, a mixed form that's designed to be early allergen introduction products. We think we should stick with the plain natural foods um, in a form that the baby can take. Um, so with butters, we can kind of extrapolate from peanut butter to things like tahini or tree nut butters for similar amounts. So a few teaspoons um, with an egg, a younger child may not be able to eat a whole egg, but a portion may be a third or a half of an egg in an appropriate form. Um, with things like soft cooked fish or shellfish or cereal grains like wheat, um, it may be a few tablespoons, but I think that amount sort of increases with time. Um, but I think, and Dr. Chan can correct me here if there's something that else that's been sort of clarified about this, but I think that a lot of the decisions about portion size were either trying to be purists and figure out how much protein is in a serving and to give a certain amount of protein at each serving, or we're trying to model it after the LEAP study, or we're trying to sort of give a typical infant portion size according to appetite and age. Is that a fair summary, do you think, Edmund? Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, the problem with being too prescriptive, uh, such as, you know, two teaspoons of peanut butter three times a week is, in my opinion, it, it almost sets up some families for failure if they're unable to get their infant to eat that large of an amount. Like even if you dilute it and mix it in with other foods, you know, sometimes it's just not feasible for certain infants to, to be able to eat that much. And because the LEAP study didn't have several arms, like in, in my ideal world, the LEAP study would have had like four or five arms where you had one arm that had it once a week, and then another arm that had half that amount three times a week, another arm that had half that amount once a week, and so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, age-appropriate serving, I, I completely agree with that uh, maybe for that particular infant and that particular family, two teaspoons of peanut butter is not really in their mind age-appropriate. It's like more for an older child. Uh, and so I really like age appropriate. I really like weekly, you know, for the families that find three times a week hard for every single allergenic food, because you can imagine, you know, if, if we're just thinking peanut, it might not be that difficult. But if we're thinking peanut, at least four different non-choking tree nuts, sesame, uh, egg, and dairy, and fish, and shellfish, to do each of those, in two gram protein amounts three times a week ends up being a lot of allergenic foods and a lot of labor um, potentially. And so again, like maybe once a week, even though it wasn't, you know, that wasn't an arm of the LEAP study might be okay, especially for, for certain uh, foods. Um, so yeah, I'd like to have some flexibility. I don't like to be too rigid, but regularity is also very, very important. So I like at least weekly. I like words like uh, age appropriate. And of course, non-choking. Uh, our ENT colleagues 
really, you know, cringe when we don't add the words non-choking. But I, I think Edmund and I would both agree that when you meet a family and you ask, have you given peanut? And they say definitively to you, yes, we gave it. That we both get a sort of cringe because we think, oh, that sounds like past tense. Yeah. That sounds like we did it. We took a video in the high chair, seven months or six months or five months. We gave peanut and it's done. And on our end, we're thinking, great, but what about since then, right? How many more times have you been giving it? So just to reiterate that, if people were going to take anything home from this, babies are very plastic, meaning, you know, malleable. Um, their immune systems are very open to either choosing tolerance or allergy at this very critical age. So what you're doing week to week has huge impact. And doing something once, feeding a food once, is almost never enough to keep the sliding door open to sort of have a, a, a permanent impact. Yeah, it, it's really quite extraordinary that, you know, the LEAP investigators were already, you know, that concerned about that aspect that they designed in the three times a week, not just for a couple of years, but for five long years. So, you know, parents uh, really need to receive a lot of education with, with respect to this. And it doesn't have to be a burden. You know, it, it can be, again, using it, those nice words that we just talked about. And then maybe, you know, being more creative, like using a, a food processor or a blender and, and just mixing it all together uh, into a, a nice smoothie or, or some type of nice uh, baby food. Um, you know, certainly I had to be creative like that with my own son. Uh, when he was young um and uh you know to this day I, I i still reflect back on you know how difficult it was to maintain regularity for tree nuts because you know again leap leap focused on peanut the guidelines tend to focus on egg and peanut and then foods like tree nuts which we see quite a bit in clinical practice are kind of left out of the conversation um, and when you try to introduce them early and give them often, you, it's really quite humbling to realize how challenging it may be when, when your child may not even like be that fond of the taste of the tree nuts and, and try to give them, you know, that three times a week and not choking for them. Um, so yeah, I have to have a lot of respect for, for what we're, we're suggesting and recommending to these parents. Sorry. If I can just jump in for uh, on a couple of points as well, I think what you both said is really important. Um, but I think one of the things that we also need to remember is this is this guidance to prevent, hopefully prevent food allergy. The other part is that food is not only medical nutrition therapy. Food is part of a, a family's identity, part of their their social, their their you know, spiritual, uh, cultural connections, and parceling the. Inter early introduction within the larger scale. I think Dr. Chani spoke very clearly about you know being creative. And I think if you can encourage that with families right from the start and as part of that shared decision making, uh, it, it's really a strong message to the families that it's it's a team approach and it's a family approach. The other piece that I want to pick up on, if I can, is a question that came into the chat. And the question related to how do you do this early introduction when you've already got a child? an older sip who has food allergy. And so this requires uh, a fair bit of creativity to be sure. And then that we also need to think about, you know, the importance of having that early introduction against ha keeping the older child safe. And if their ch children are relatively close in age and the, the older one is a toddler and very curious, you know, as you know, three and four year olds often are, and wanting to get into all kinds of things, the importance of um, keeping a safe space at home is particularly important as well. Um, and if it's an older child who is allergic, um, a younger child is an infant and hadn't required that early introduction, to make those very special events for, for each of the older children. So it might be that uh, if, if it's a two parent home, that one parent uh, takes the older child out uh, so that the younger child can continue to be introduced you know, in a way that is, is very focused on the child, but it's relaxed and not having to, the, the parents aren't having to also uh, consider um, as much the immediate safety of, of the older child who, who happens to be allergic. 
Yeah, no, those are, those are really good points. Um, the scenario of the family having an older child with a food allergy and needing to introduce for the younger one is just something that, you know, creates so many strong emotions and, and it's uh, really important we're, we're empathetic to that situation. And some families in that situation may be comfortable feeding the younger sibling and having peanut in the home environment and just being very careful not to mix meals and things like that. Uh, but other families may not, and we have to recognize that and, and work with the families who are not comfortable with that and be creative, such as, uh, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll discuss with, with families maybe the parent who's not allergic or, or the parent who's comfortable uh, going outside of the home and, and having that meal uh, that has peanut in it uh, with the younger sibling um, and making sure that when come home, there's no cross contamination. Um, something that like, you know, hopefully we'll get a chance to circle back to a little bit later is what are the, what, what's the role of uh, new uh, cutting edge therapies. And so one of my biggest uh, areas of interest currently for, for research is uh, food and oral immunotherapy to treat food allergy. So where that might enter the conversation is if we have this older sibling with food allergy and younger sibling where we're trying to prevent, maybe if that older sibling gets into oral immunotherapy and has their threshold increased, then there's going to be less concern about having that allergenic food in the home uh, so that uh, the younger sibling can get the prevention uh, exposures uh, while the older sibling had already had their threshold increased through oral immunotherapy. Thank you for that, Dr. Chen. And I think that kind of speaks a little bit as well on one of the questions um, that's at the top of the Slido uh, page now that somebody was asking, you know, is long-term long avoidance the only option for management for infants who did fail primary prevention and did have um, and develop food allergies despite early introduction? Um, I'm not sure if any of the other panelists want to weigh in on that question or have any other kind of uh, thoughts on that before we move on to the next question. Well, you know, I'll address it from the perspective of, I actually just did a lecture on this at the American Academy meeting um, last week. And the reason I was asked to speak about that is um, I was part of a, a paper where we were looking at the risk of anaphylaxis in infants compared to older children and how that impacts uh, both prevention as well as treatment. In addition, I've been very involved in preschool peanut oral immunotherapy research the past few years, and we published uh, a safety paper, an effectiveness paper, and just in the past couple of months, we published on infant peanut oral immunotherapy outcomes compared to non-infant preschoolers. And already the preschool peanut oral immunotherapy is hugely impressive with um, you know, very high safety, very high effectiveness compared to older children, for example, compared to children six and, and up. Um, the preschoolers are, are much safer and they have uh, better effectiveness, but the infants, took that even further that we studied uh, where they had even better safety than the non-infant preschoolers. Uh, none of them had severe reactions. The infants that we studied, we had over 60 infants that we uh, followed uh, who were undergoing uh, uh, peanut oral immunotherapy. And based on, on uh, that data, as well as there was another trial published of the U.S. called the IMPACT trial, where they looked at one to three-year-olds undergoing peanut oral immunotherapy. And it was a much longer study where they followed for uh, three years. And they had a, a primary outcome of where they did the OIT for two and a half years, and then they had uh, 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 some of the uh, patients stop oral immunotherapy for six months. And then they did oral challenges again at three years uh, after they had started. And about 21% achieved that gold, you know, sort of outcome of uh, what, what we call sustained unresponsiveness, where you stop peanut for six months and the peanut allergy does not return. And what was really, really interesting about that 21% 
was that those at the younger ages when they started OIT were able to achieve that outcome much more likely than those who started OIT later. And so again, it, it suggested that um, the window of opportunity for optimal achievement of what we call tolerance, where the pain allergy doesn't come back, is best uh, achieved when you start it early. And that's in, in concert, uh, in congruence with the findings of our study on infant OIT. And so, um, like, really, these are recent thoughts of mine, uh, but I'm really, based on that data, uh, very keen on giving families an option for what I would call, quote unquote, failed primary prevention. So where they've tried to introduce early, where they've even tried hard to give uh, regularly and eaten often. And despite that, for whatever reason, the infant still develops peanut or other allergy. Uh, my um, uh, recommendation would be to flip them immediately, uh, less than 12 months of age into OIT, rather than go through years of avoidance and um, potentially have uh, outcomes such as increased anxiety uh, in, you know, and compromised quality of life. Not that that always happens, but there's a chance. And there's also a chance that the food allergy might not be outgrown. Uh, and also, if oral immunotherapy is attempted at older ages, it is typically much more difficult to adhere to, uh, either because of increased anaphylactic reactions uh, uh, and, um, you know, difficulties uh, uh, with adherence due to uh, more, more reactions in general. Um, so I'd really like that to be at least an option. It doesn't have to be done for sure, but you know, for avoidance to be the only option when there's failed primary prevention and knowing what we know these days, um, it, it doesn't seem to be the best approach. Sure. And uh, Dr. Chan, just to clarify, OIT or oral immunotherapy, uh, what would that be kind of just uh, in simple terms? That would be um, what, having a what we call buildup phase of where the infant is exposed to a tiny amount of peanut, uh, for example, 10 milligrams of peanut protein. So a, a fraction of the amounts that we were talking about earlier for, for prevention. And, and doing that with a physician, with an allergist, uh, and um, doing that in the office, and then in between visits, doing that same amount at home. And then every time the amount is increased, doing that with the uh, allergist. And that, that whole, what we call buildup lasts usually about five, or six months. And then after that, the uh, infant is maintained on what we, what we call a maintenance dose. Typically, it's about one peanut amount, so 300 milligram of peanut protein, and then continuing that for years. Uh, and, and so it's the same, you know, discussion of how many years, the same discussion we just had for prevention. The LEAP study did five years, and we don't really know for OIT how many years it takes for the peanut allergy to not come back. I just uh, described that American study where they did two and a half years of OIT and then six months of no peanut, and then they uh, tried peanut again. And so that study, uh, two and a half years. Uh, but um, you know that's sort of the process of OIT in a nutshell. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, and I do see that there are more questions coming in into Slido, which is awesome. There's definitely a lot of questions about this topic. So I, you know, I am weary about the time. We are taking our last question at 8.25 this evening. However, uh, one of the questions um, is asking, uh, did we talk about that mustard was an allergen, which I believe was kind of referring to what Dr. Pajra might have touched on when she was speaking um, so if you can kindly just confirm that question. Thanks very much. So mustard is one of the priority allergens in Canada. Uh, in Canada, there are uh, 10 foods that are priority allergens. And so mustard is one. The, the complete list is then milk, eggs, peanuts, all tree nuts, fish, uh, shellfish, uh, so crustaceans and mollusks, fish, shellfish, soy, soy, wheat, mustard and sesame. So those foods in Canada need to be called out on labels uh, 
anything, any food that's pre-packaged. And they need to also to be uh, called out on food labels if it's an ingredient within an ingredient. So if it's, you know, say for example, mustard within pepperoni or soy within pepperoni that's on a pizza, that would need to be called out. Um, but that rule doesn't apply for uh, foods that are non-priority allergens. Sure, thank you. Um, and I think just in touching with the non-priority allergens, there is another question kind of relating to that. And so somebody had asked for non quote, quote unquote allergen foods or spices, is it still recommended to wait a certain amount of time in between introduction of each new item? Mm -hmm. So I can speak to that. Um, the answer is no. Um, and moreover, there's risk in having your your child, um, you know, there is this handout that I've seen in pediatric offices, which talks about spending three days on each vegetable. And it used to be you start with a certain color of vegetable and then and then you go to fruits because the child might like the taste of the fruits too much and thus refuse the vegetables. And only then would you progress to other foods and the allergens were sort of delayed and delayed. So you can imagine if everything takes a few days that quickly days turn into weeks and weeks turn into months and we don't have early introduction of the things that we're trying the most to get in early to prevent allergy. So the answer is no. For foods that are very unlikely to cause allergic reactions, which covers, I would say, most or all um, most or all fruits, vegetables, meats, um, for most infants, legumes, um, grains, you know, and I know that allergies exist to selected fruits or rarely vegetables or grains, but for the most part, those things should be introduced expediently, you know, uh, quickly, efficiently given, and if everything seems fine, keep going. So we don't want to be in a holding pattern for X number of days. For some reason, it always seems to be, you know, three or seven. So I joke it's either biblical or it's somehow, you know, encrypted. These numbers have been passed down from older family members. But no, there really isn't. For allergens, for allergens, we want people to introduce them um, on their own, meaning you know, pad thai would not be an ideal first food for a baby because in that we have possibly shrimp and possibly peanut and possibly uh, wheat noodles um, and possibly fish sauce. Um, so that's very confusing. We want to keep the experiment simple so, so, so that it's easy for parents to know what's causing a reaction. Um, but no, there really isn't a hard and fast rule about waiting times. Awesome. Thank you. And I like that uh, example of the pad thai. It's certainly one of the meals that I would eat, but perhaps not to my, you know, little niece. Um, so with that said, uh, somebody else had asked, so how do you know if a child or infant is allergic to something? Uh, I could uh, answer that. So it really uh, depends on the history. And so, you know, pediatric allergists spend a lot of time taking a very detailed uh, history of reaction or introduction. And so, like we were discussing previously, if an infant has never tried the food in, of concern uh, previously, we, we actually don't know if they're truly allergic to that food. And it gets back to the hesitancy is issue and how we can hopefully educate families that the testing is not as accurate as we would like. And therefore, uh, if we know that, you know, infant anaphylaxis has been studied quite well in recent years and the rate of anaphylaxis and severe anaphylaxis, like difficulty breathing or passing out or fainting type of reactions is very, very, very rare in infants uh, compared to older children, then hopefully we can at least get to try the food for the first time to give us that history that we'll be asking. And sometimes with the hesitancy, 
Uh, I'll even talk about, oh, maybe the first time you give it, it's, it's a smaller amount. For example, like a fingernail sized amount. It's, it's like something we can all visually uh, look at and, and relate to. Um, and then so if the infant has that first trial, then we can ask more questions. Then we can ask, oh, um, so let's say nothing happened, then that would be easy. But if something happened, if there was a rash as a very common sign that uh, parents might describe, then we can ask further details. Was the rash only around the mouth? Uh, for example, uh, there's a lot of families where there's redness around the mouth uh, with introducing certain foods. And that doesn't have to be allergy, actually. That could just be irritation of sensitive skin. Uh, a lot of these families have infants who have quite sensitive skin. And so that would be quite helpful. And then, you know, if the reaction is more than that, then we'll ask a lot about the nature of the rash, uh, where the actual hives, for example, um, the nature of any respiratory symptoms that, that the infant may have experienced or gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, the timing is very, very important as well. Uh, how quickly the symptoms appeared. Uh, and an, an allergic reaction, and what we call an IgE-mediated, uh, potentially anaphylactic allergic reaction, which has been the subject of this evening, it should occur very quickly within minutes, um, typically within 30 minutes and not uh, longer than within two hours of ingestion. And similarly, the duration is, is quite important. Uh, so typically... Uh, less than 24 hours durations uh, of symptoms if the food isn't continually uh, being fed. And, and the history where a parent might say, oh, you know, my child had rash for, for seven days after I tried X food. No, we wouldn't be thinking that's a, 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 an immediate type food allergy. Uh, and so really it's, 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 you know, being able to generate those types of details through uh, a history of ingestion. Great, thank you. And I think it, it really speaks to the importance of having, you know, uh, a good sense of the history of the child. And, and it's very individualized, if if uh, that's what I'm getting correctly. It really depends on the child and and uh, their personal uh, signs and symptoms if they were to have an allergic reaction. Um, with that said, the next question I think that is the most relate, uh, related is, Somebody now asks, if peanuts have been tolerated for one to two weeks, what are the chances the child would react during week three or four of introduction? Do you want me to take that one? Or? Yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, I mean, we could both uh, sure. give our take, but go ahead. Yeah. Sure. So there are some older studies that looked at when, you know, peanut allergic reactions in particular were likely to happen. It, it, it tends to be overwhelmingly in the first few times that it's given. And I think we can extrapolate that for the most part to, to other allergens too. But there are some important exceptions. If you give it in the first two weeks and it's fine, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll assume that, um, a child had eaten it a few times in those first two weeks. Um, it's unlikely that there will be a sudden change of circumstance in week three, unless the amount of peanut that they're given suddenly increases. So sometimes those first few givings are really tiny. You know, they're almost, you know, homeopathic. And when you really take the time and take the history, which like Edmund said, we, we go horse doing, trying to make sure we understand all the details. Um, you realize that that was the first time that the child had, let's say uh, the equivalent of a full teaspoon or many more of the Bumba snacks that we also might use, right? The peanut puffs or something, some other peanut containing food. So it might be that there was a big jump in the portion size, but assuming that they had been having either the same amount um, and there was no big change there, um, or there wasn't a big interruption, which in theory can't happen in a, in a week. It, it's sort of at the very, very extreme end of how long it might take um, a child's sort of immune system to forget a food. And by extreme end, I mean, it's hard to imagine that you could have such a, an abrupt change from one Wednesday, let's say to the next. 
So it's usually more in the range of, of months and sometimes weeks that it would take for, for there to be a sudden abrupt change. I don't mean to make up numbers or patterns here, but I guess the short answer is that if it's been okay in the first two weeks and you continue doing what you're doing with even more with a gradual increase of the amount, that we would hope that everything stays copacetic and the child is fine with that food. If it's stopped abruptly and you don't give it for three months and then circle back to it, I would say all bets are off. And we actually don't know if that um, evolving tolerance will have been um, continued. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree. Like, uh, you know, the concept of uh, uh, allergen thresholds is something that comes to mind with the question like that. Um, so just like what Dr. Levine was saying, like if the first few amounts were very small, meaning they were below that particular uh, individual's uh, reaction threshold, if they had the food allergy already, then uh, you may not see any symptoms. And, and so there's been these studies done where, for example, uh, let's say with peanut, 20% uh, of peanut allergic patients would react at 100 milligram protein. So if you're giving less than that, then they're just not going to react. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is where we're starting to get a little bit uncomfortable with how long it's been since the last uh, ingestion. And so to take that, you know, question to an extreme, let's say, you know, the, the peanut was given in week one, and then there was a three week gap, uh, and it wasn't given again. Uh, so, you know, although it's not very highly likely in those three weeks that uh, the child could go from no not allergic to allergic, it's not impossible. If you think again about the LEAP study, how they needed those infants to eat peanut three times a week and uh, having a two or three week gap is not following that protocol. And so I actually have had patients like that who haven't eaten for two to four weeks. And then, you know, clinically, we feel that they've gone from not being allergic to being allergic. I can't say that it happens often, but again, this delves into the issue of how we wish there, there were studies which went into all these permutations of frequency uh, and, and duration of exposure. Awesome. Thank you for that. And I am just being mindful of the time. We have approximately five minutes left and I still see questions coming in. So I just want to thank the audience for, for the continued questions and, and uh, interest in this topic. Uh, with that said, I'm going to do one final round robin of uh, questions and I will post just one last question for the panelists. Um, if you can quickly kind of summarize a, a brief answer for um, a final question, which is going to be, what does an allergy rash look like, for example, uh, compared to teething, rashes, or others? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. It's really good. I, I, I think what we need to do is to distinguish between eczema or atopic dermatitis um, and hives slash urticaria because those are the two most common rashes that we have to discuss like like dr levine was saying if we're in clinic it's almost like you know, we go horse discussing those two rashes and one basically it's been confusing over the years because like you know families get them mixed up uh, but according to latest research and our current knowledge one increases the risk of an infant developing a food allergy and the other is the manifestation of uh, potential manifestation of the food allergy. So um, eczema is what increases an infant's risk. And that's a, a rough sort of a sandpapery type of rash over typical areas like the face and, and the elbows and, and the knees typically for infants, the uh, outer aspect of the elbows uh, and the knees. Um, it could be quite widespread as well. It's extremely itchy and it's chronic, meaning that it tends to stay there for days and for weeks uh, and, and just keeps persisting until there's some type of intervention 
or the child gets much older. Um, and, and so that's putting the infant at risk. It's a skin barrier defect. There's genetics involved. Um, it's, it's an underlying common element for children who are at risk of allergy. But when we talk about trying peanut uh, and then developing a rash, that's, those are the hives, which are the bumps that kind of look like mosquito bites. They're raised. Uh, they can be blotchy, different shapes and sizes. They're also very, very itchy. Um, and those, while, you know, when, when a child eats the food, they could be on the face, it could be on the neck and chest. They could also go to other areas. But unlike the eczema, these uh, come on quickly and they go away relatively quickly. Uh, typically a few hours duration, uh, no longer than uh, 24 hours. Um, but, you know, I, I'm sure this is something you, you can, uh, you know, describe as well, Dr. Levine, how, how often families get these two rashes mixed up and they, they sort of say that the eczema is caused by a food allergy, by eating a food. Yeah, and I think, I think you said it, the, the timing is everything. So sometimes I'll clarify that, that hives aren't really a rash per se. It's more like a weather system moving through. So there's something called histamine released, right? You know, we all take antihistamines. So histamine is one of the key chemicals that the body uses to signal itself, hey, it's time to use the allergic immune system. And when that histamine is released into the skin, you get these mosquito bite looking welt things along with a lot of flushing and redness but fast forward a few hours or sometimes in some situations with antihistamines which are not the first choice treatment for food allergic reactions but might be used sometimes for rashes like that it's gone and there should be nothing left on the skin except maybe scratch marks but eczema is days, weeks, months. Eczema is chronic. Eczema has moved in. The skin architecture has changed. The topography has changed. You can feel it with your eyes closed. And it's extremely chronic. And that's the biggest difference. Diaper rash is not an allergic rash. Um, rashes that are caused by viruses can be confusing, but they're generally not allergic rashes, even though they can sometimes hijack that part of the immune system too. But I think, the, just to emphasize, it, the timing is such a huge key in differentiating what's an allergic rash and what's not. Yeah, precisely. And, and you know, this, uh, does a food cause eczema? It's a whole different lecture and, and cafe scientific in itself. Yeah. It's such a complicated topic because there's been a rocky history with it. But the simple takeaway from tonight is no. Food does not cause eczema because if it did, then the whole, you know, cafe scientific from this evening, we throw it out the window because like, then how would we ever get early introduction? Because a lot of these infants have eczema as a risk factor. How before, we, how yeah. We, and before they've started to eat. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, but we would, we would not be able to implement uh, early introduction if, if these foods caused eczema. Absolutely. I think we can certainly agree that we can spend another cafe talking about just eczema and an early introduction. Um, but with that said, in closing, I would like to thank our expert panelists and all of our audiences for engaging in tonight's discussion. Certainly, I think it was a very uh, hot topic, if I say so myself, and it was a very lit discussion and I hope you found it informative as much as I did and you got as much as out of it as much as I did. So please look for upcoming Cafe Scientifiques and details can be found at umanitoba.ca slash Cafe Scientifique as shown on the screen as well as a link to the video of tonight's discussion which will be posted in a few days. So I thank you all again and uh, have a good night.